So welcome everybody. I'm Tina Miser. I know some of you. Um, does everybody see a health coach here? Some people don't. Okay. So I'm one of two. I get to go to Peru and Wabash. I'm so excited and lucky that I get to do that. Um, <clears throat> thank you guys for coming. Obviously today's presentation is exercise is medicine. So we all know exercise is good for us because why? Right. Right. <laughs> Energy, right? Good your heart. Yep, yep. So, how many of you guys exercise every day? Show of, show of hands. Awesome. So, we know it's good for us, <laughs> and we kind of know why it's good for us and four of us are doing it. <laughs> Almost every day, okay. That's a good, good one. Um, so how many of us are exercising three days out of the week? Okay, that's better, that's better, okay. So skipping along there, um, <clears throat> a lot of times knowing why it's important is important is the most important thing that we can do because sometimes we don't really buy into it. We are told the media says it's good for us. Maybe our doctor who's a little bit round says you should exercise and that's kind of hard to take, right? Because they're not even following their own advice. Front row seats right here, right here. Economics of exercise, you guys probably don't even know that there's an economic benefit to exercising. And then talking about bringing it back to you, making it personal, what is your goal? So this is from the National Institute of Health. This is the things that decide if we're healthy people or not. Number one, physical inactivity. And number two, if you are overweight or obese. Love that term. So out of 35 different health measures that they used to decide which state was the healthiest, Indiana was 38th down on the list. So yeah. We could blame the weather this past six months though, right? <clears throat> so Indiana has quite a ways to go. Um, if you think about the standards of what we're being judged on as far as what makes us healthy or not, uh, how many people, how, what percentage would you say of Americans are meeting the standards for uh, physical activity? 10%. 10%? Glass is half full, right? <laughs> okay. 80% of Americans do not meet the standards for aerobic activity and muscle strengthening. So yeah, it's pretty bad. What percent of Americans are so sedentary that they are getting zero benefit at all? Those are, these are the true couch potatoes of the world. What percent? 50? Uh -huh. 40. 45. 45% are not sufficiently active to achieve any health benefit. This is huge, especially when we're saying your leading health um, indicator is your physical activity. So we're missing the mark big time here, right? So again, just reiterating, exercise is powerful. Um, some people, uh, have chosen to exercise and they've been able to come off of their medicines. It is that powerful of an effect. Those people over 60, so we work, right, with people over 60. People over 60, less than 2.5% of that population group is getting a modest level of activity. This 
physical activity is the number one thing that we can do. So any sort of movement that we can introduce throughout the day is going to help to get us better. And when we're working with our clients, if we can practice what we preach, then it comes across as a little more genuine too, right? So why is it important? Why am I here? How do I have the ability to say that this is true? Um, I always use evidence-based medicine. And so for those of you who I coach, you've probably heard that term before. Evidence-based medicine is talking about clinical experience and things that are important to the patients as well, and then the latest best available research. So everything that is gonna be included in this presentation is evidence-based medicine. So exercise is so important that they have proven it helps if you have diabetes. How it helps is your body's reception to insulin, which is what your pancreas makes, will improve if you exercise. So if you have diabetes, one of the things that you can do starting today is after a meal, go for a walk for 10 minutes. So as simple as that will help start to improve your diabetes. Um, I took a little loop on your path here. So I went out up to the parking lot and then back around again, took me 4.45 minutes, okay? and it was about almost a third of a mile. So there you go. As soon as you finish your snack or as soon as you finish your meal, take two big loops or three small loops if it's, you don't wanna take your life into your own hands by going to the parking lot. Okay, so diabetes proven to be helped with exercise. Cancer, this is a big one. They are constantly coming out with new information but the three big ones that they can say for sure are positively affected, breast, colon, and endometrial. So a lot of hormones associated with cancer development and exercise helps to lower those levels that get out of control and accelerate tumor growth. Weight control, no big surprise there, right? After not smoking, though, healthy weight is the most important thing that you can do to prevent cancer. Um, there are 18 different cancers that they can say are directly related to whether or not you, your BMI is above 25 or not. So, <clears throat> big, important note, write it down. <laughs> weight is associated with 18 different types of cancers. And somebody noticed that this morning. They said the um, exercise helps lower your blood pressure. It, yes, it does. More evidence-based medicine, heart disease, lowering those triglycerides. If you don't remember what triglycerides are, that's one of the numbers that's gonna pop up in your lipid panel that you either have taken with us or at your doctor's office. Triglycerides often are elevated if you are consuming more calories than you are burning. Um, sugary things, alcohol, processed foods, those all elevate your triglycerides. <clears throat> if you exercise a little bit more than just modestly, you can actually lower your LDL, which is the bad cholesterol. Anybody ever achieve a runner's high? and be able to say that they feel better after they exercise? Anybody hate their life when they try to run? <laughs> Seriously, has anybody ever exercised and, fe <laughs> and felt a little bit better afterwards? Okay, so it's true, right? I'm not making it up. This is evidence-based medicine. <laughs> Osteoporosis, very important. Um, even um, subtle weight-bearing exercises. So um, <clears throat> not just necessarily lifting weights, but just walking is considered a weight-bearing exercise. And new research being done in the area of dementia, so showing there's something going on with the brain and exercise.
Arthritis is kind of an interesting one. If you have arthritis, you don't want to move because you're achy and you're stiff. But evidence shows that the more you move, the more lubrication your body produces. So if you don't move, you're going to feel worse. So it's kind of like you just got to get over that initial hump and be able to start exercising. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Anybody want to argue with me? No? Okay. Darn. So I hear this a lot in my uh, coaching practice that, hey, mom and dad, they have high cholesterol and I'm going to die anyway. So they, you've thrown in the towel before you even started, right? I get that. My husband says the same thing to me about his blood pressure. He's like, oh, mom and dad have it. I'm just going to have it. And it's like, okay. It's harder to deal with your spouse, right, than a, than a client. <clears throat> so, yes, that's right. Your genetics can set you up. You can have a propensity to have high cholesterol or to be overweight or to have high blood pressure. But genetics is actually a small part. What you do can trump your genetics. So food choices, exercise, whether you smoke or not, whether you drink alcohol or not, are more important and more powerful than the genes that your parents gave you. I love this little cartoon. So we maybe know, <laughs> we maybe know somebody like the skinny person and they are horribly, horribly diseased on the inside. You just don't know it from the outside. So just because you are thin doesn't necessarily mean that you are healthy. So this is not an excuse. <laughs> I'm going somewhere with this. Okay. Better to be fat and fit than thin and unfit. So say you just genetically have got this nice skinny body. If you are smoking and drinking and eating donuts for breakfast, you're better, you're worse off than somebody who maybe is carrying around a few extra pounds but is doing everything right because that level of fitness is more important. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's talk about the cost of inactivity. A lot of times people don't care too much about health until it hits them in the pocketbook, right? That's why you're all here is for your points. <laughs> I think it was because I was presenting. That's, that's what I think. So health claims actually increase as your activity levels decrease. Um, 250,000 Americans die prematurely every year due to inactivity. So they have this big number, $117 billion in healthcare costs are associated with inadequate physical activity. I don't really understand that number. Like that's hard for me to relate to, $117 billion. What does that mean? So I felt that it's probably better to break it down per person. So here are our healthcare costs and they've got it related to BMI. So this is what some little guy in an insurance company does somewhere. And he can say, the higher your BMI goes, the more your company spends on you. And so they can put a number to it. So a person with a BMI between 25 and 30, so if you remember 25 is that upper limit that we don't wanna go above. If you are above 25 but yet under 30, you're going to experience 17% greater healthcare costs. Now, if you have a BMI above 30, you're going to experience 52% greater healthcare costs. So, what that breaks down to is that 25 to 30 person spends about $4,500 more a year in healthcare. The person with the BMI above 30 spends $5,855 more per year. So think about what you could do with that money instead. So what do we do? What do we do about this when it affects our wallet, when it affects our health? We kind of have to look at exercise as a non-negotiable thing. 
it's like a prescription from your doctor. So you have an infection and you're going to the doctor and you're going to get a script for some antibiotics. You're going to take it, right? Because you want to feel better. And you're going to take your prescription all the way through, right? Not until you just feel better and then save it for later, because that's not what you're supposed to do with that, in case you didn't know. So you treat exercise like it is an actual prescription. <clears throat> you can visit your doctor, ask him what he thinks you should do, or ask her what she thinks you should do. You can join a gym or join the YMCA. They have lots of personal trainers. They can help you write some sort of a, an exercise prescription that's going to be personalized for you. Because what you like, you might hate. So you have to make sure that you're actually enjoying it. We don't want anybody trying to exercise and cursing my name. Like, <laughs> find, there's lots of things that we can do that will be fun, and I guarantee that you'll find something. So you may be thinking, what's, how much time is this really going to take? Like, I got so much crap going on in my life, I don't have time to jam one more thing in, right? Anybody feel like that? Right? So 30 minutes of exercise, four to five times a week. Doesn't sound like too much, right? Could probably do that. So thinking about the time you take to brush your teeth, brush your hair, hopefully take a shower, right? Those are things that you wouldn't skip. Those are things that you do every single day. So if you, if you think about the time you're taking for your personal hygiene, the exercise is non-negotiable just like that. You just want to build it into your schedule and take time to do it every day. So these are the guidelines. 150 minutes a week of moderate activity. What does moderate activity mean? Any ideas? Walking is considered moderate. Not plodding along like my mom does when I try to walk with her. <laughs> and you're like, oh, come on. It has to be like a little bit of a walk. Don't tell her I said that. Um, something else. OK. So tennis, swimming, aerobic dancing. Anybody ever done that Just Dance on uh, the Wii? Yeah. That'll get your heart rate going. <laughs> um, jumping rope. Heavy gardening. So that would be like, you know, moving like mulch and using the wheelbarrow, things that get your sweat going a little bit. Hiking. All of these things are considered moderate activity. So, you know, you don't have to go to a gym and just spend your time on the treadmill. You can get out there in nature and, and hike around. That would be considered moderate activity. So all adults need 150 minutes of heart pumping activity per week. Down there at the bottom, research shows even those 10 minute bouts of physical activity work. So I talked about that, especially with diabetes. So if you really feel like I just can't devote 30 minutes a day to doing this, try to break it up into <coughs> little 10 minute segments. So even 10 minute segments are better than nothing at all. So thinking about how many of us raised our hand that said we exercise every day? How many of us raised our hand said we exercise three times a week? How do we, how do we make this happen? How do we say, you know what, this is important and I want to make this happen, is you got to decide what your goal is going to be. Like, what can you possibly envision yourself doing? And the end result is that you're going to feel better. The end result is that you're going to maybe improve your numbers, come off some medications, lose a few pounds maybe, right? So trying to get started, number one thing is schedule your exercise. Do you guys have um, calendar appointments where you got the next thing going? Maybe you got the reminders on your phone, right? So trying to utilize that calendar scheduler to put it in your calendar. 
exercise or go for a walk. Find a coworker that's gonna be your buddy. Make sure you guys both aren't slackers. You can only be a, <laughs> you can only be a slacker. <laughs> You can take turns being slackers, but you both can't be slackers on the same day, okay? So put it on there. Exercise with Bob or walking, you know, today at lunch. Put it on the calendar. What kind of exercise are you going to do? So a lot of people maybe haven't done a lot of different types of exercises. Um, make a master list of everything. Some of the things that we talked about today, um, maybe something if you just want to Google, things to do for exercise. And make your little bucket list. You're just trying it. Like this is an experiment. I'm going to try swimming at the Y today. Oh, hated that. So then the next day, you know, it's okay. Try something else. I'm going to try a, a, a spin class, okay? Oh, hated that. Oh, hated that, right? <laughs> About died in my first spin class, too. It was terrible. Um, so you just, you're just trying, right? You have a lighthearted attitude about this. You'll find something that you enjoy. I promise you will. Where to exercise. So some people love the gym. They like to just, you know, tunnel vision, and they're processing whatever happened throughout the day. Some people hate the gym, they gotta be outside. So deciding and just figuring yourself out. Proper clothing and equipment. So if you are really cheap, then the easiest thing to do is just exercise outside with a nice pair of shoes, okay? You don't have to go to a fancy store, just get a nice pair of shoes and walk. It's probably the cheapest thing you can do. and then starting slow, that's important. So if you do go to spin class, don't knock yourself out of the park that first day because you have to walk tomorrow and you have to come to work tomorrow. So just take it easy, take it slow. One of the other things that's been proven to be very beneficial for sticking with your exercise plan is to keep an exercise journal. So just like um, maybe some of you have kept a food journal because your health coach said it really does work, um, keep an exercise journal and it'll help you kind of keep track where as you're working through your different types of exercises, you can reflect back on it and be like, oh yeah, I guess it wasn't that bad. Maybe I'll try that again. Or hopefully when you're six weeks down the road, you can say, man, I'm walking two miles in, you know, 25 minutes now. I, it used to, what? <laughs> that was a look. <laughs> it used to take me 45 minutes. So, you know, something like that. You can go back and you can reflect on that. <laughs> so goal, <laughs> goal setting is important. Um, if you can kind of have an end goal in mind, like I really would want to just start exercising, okay? That's an okay goal, but it's not very specific. How are you going to measure that goal? So how, how would you say, like let's say you just want to start exercising, how can we better define that? How can we make a goal that would meet all of these requirements? Perfect, right? So it's specific. What, do you, what kind of exercise are you going to do 30 minutes, three times a week? Uh, walking. Okay. So walking 30 minutes, three times a week. It's specific. It's measurable. It's achievable, right? You're not going to die by doing that, right? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, realistic and timely. So maybe put an end cap on that, like I'm going to walk 30 minutes three times a week for the next six weeks. Bam, there's your goal. So that's what I'm talking about with making some sort of a goal. Um, finding an accountability partner, right? So you can let your coworkers know, let your family know what kind of goal you're going to be doing and hopefully they'll help hold you to it. Not say, let's go for ice cream instead. So some of the things that we found helpful, uh, my fitness pal, does anybody use it? Anybody used it in the past? Does anybody love it? 
Oh, we got one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I kind of hate it. Um, yeah, I I found that um, it's very <laughs> it's very disheartening. That chocolate brownie was a whole lot of calories, and then I couldn't enjoy it, so I didn't eat it. Um, but it does work, and you can think about it, using it for a short term just to sort of educate yourself, like this is how many calories I'm consuming, how freaking long am I going to have to walk to walk off that brownie, okay? So you can just use it as a tool. Um, this Couch to 5K, love that. I actually like that app. <laughs> That's a good one. That got me my first bout of running. So um, really helpful and you can kind of stick with that same program until you're, you don't like gasp for breath and then you can move to the next one. So that works really well. Has anybody used Couch to 5K? Twice. Twice. I'm still on week two about six weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> 5K is Saturday. So we'll see how it goes. Oh, good, good. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm hopeful. I think so too. That's why I gave you the look for the two miles for 25 I'm like, oh my God, is that what my... <laughs> I just pulled those numbers, you know, oh, out. Great. So yeah, don't, don't worry about that. No judgment there. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Who are these websites? So um, these are apps. Do you have a smartphone? Do you know what a smartphone is? <laughs> okay. <laughs> If you, um, yeah, if you don't have a smartphone, if you're on the flip phone thing, or if you don't even have a cell phone, they, you can still utilize these um, with your home computer. So if you just Google MyFitnessPal or Couch to 5K, you can use those that way too. Okay. It actually stands for Couch to 5K. It, it just, it says C yeah, no, that is it. They just abbreviate it with the C. Yeah. She's horrible. She's horrible. She's just awful because she's just like, now it's time to run. And she's so chitty. I'm like, lady, you're not the one running. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the worst to have when you're about dead. <laughs> so would you feel better if it was like somebody panting like, oh. You know, somebody going along with you instead of just she's on the couch and you're on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be on the couch, you do the five yeah. <laughs> It gets better if you really stick with it. And Tina knows that because she's my coach. First time I didn't stick with it, even though I know that it's going to get better. But, yeah. Right, it so, does get better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, so uh, takeaways, exercise is medicine. Hopefully, if you didn't already know, the evidence is out there. Um, it's not just made up. <laughs> it really does help with a lot of different conditions. Um, a lot of times that you can find some sort of exercise to do for fairly cheap. So getting that daily dose is important um, because exercise is not cumulative. So you can't really bank exercise, like knock it out of the... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, you can't really go and be really great on the weekend and then Monday through Friday go back to couch potato. So when you stop exercising, all those benefits that you get from exercise, they stop as well. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay. I have some handouts. So you don't have to take them. I won't be offended. Um, but this one handout, if you like it, uh, sometimes it's helpful. It's called Work It Off. It talks about things you eat and how long it takes you to work them off. So maybe a motivator. <laughs> so a quarter pound burger with cheese, one hour and 19 minutes of walking. Okay. What was the, uh, what was the can of pop? How long was that? Was that oh, yeah. You guys are argumentative with your answers to those questions, too. I love it. Um, it's around 50 minutes. 43 minutes of walking. Yeah. A large soda. Yeah, 43 minutes of walking. Um, so.
So that's that's one of the ones we can. You guys can come get that. So those of you who I coach with, you know, I often talk about fiber. I'm kind of geeked out about fiber because fiber has been proven to aid with weight loss. So if you are serious about starting an exercise program, well, the number one thing or the number two thing, I guess, after exercising would be to increase your fiber. And I'm not talking about Metamucil, I'm talking about real fiber. Because the, the closer you get to your daily dose of fiber, that recommended amount, it's gonna actually aid in your weight loss, if that's proven. And also, you have um, healthy bacteria in your belly. It helps with your mood. Um, fiber is the only known food for your happy bacteria in your belly, okay? So, have a list of fiber, the recommendations, and then top fiber foods. So, love that. If you don't want to download an app on your smartphone or you don't have a smartphone, I have Couch to 5K training guide right here. So no excuses. <laughs> so little things to keep in mind, race day tips. Okay. So, here's your training schedule there. <laughs> Nice. Um, so some people like to judge their exercise on their heart rate. Uh, if you do have any cardiac history or anything and your doctor has recommended that you keep your heart rate below a certain amount, um, this might be a guide that you would like. So a little bit more of an investment because you're gonna have to find something that you can monitor your heart rate with. So that's how to judge your heart rate when you're exercising.